All right. Welcome to another installment of our midweek uh, online Bible study. And we have been going through for the last, I guess, week, and this is week two of our series uh, that we're looking at the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel tells the story of Daniel, obviously, and then his compatriots who are renamed uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talked about that being a process of, you know, they were taken in exile from Israel into uh, Babylon, and, and we talked about that a little bit. Uh, and what Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of, of Babylon in that day, would want to do, and, and, and there's clues in there that Daniel and his friends are not the only ones. When, when, when last week we talked about that they... Um, had the opportunity to eat the king's food, the person who's in charge of them said, why should you look worse off than the rest of them? So what the King Nebuchadnezzar did is he would invade territories and bring some of the young people back who were promising, who were, were um, smart and, and bring them in. And then he wanted to, now I'll use the word assimilate. Assimilate means take two things that are separate and you kind of make them together. You, you move them in together. So you, you talk about assimilate when somebody joins a church, for example, and, and they start off by attending on Sunday and then maybe they gradually become more and more part of the church and they, they volunteer and they're working and they go to committees and they, all these things. Okay, so then they become a part of and so what he wanted the, all of the different ones from different areas to do is to come in and be a part of the new Babylon. He did not want them to still be uh, God-fearing of their own gods. He wanted them to worship his God. He didn't want them to, to eat their own food and have their own habits. He wanted them to change, and he changed their names. He changed all of these things. And it really was an unfriendly, in many ways, culture to their religion, to their God, to the God of Israel. And so what we, we're trying to figure out is what are some things that they did what are some things that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did to, to maintain their belief in God during that time? Now, we've talked about a couple episodes already. Uh, they're going to eat the food. They don't eat the food. Uh, it turns out that because of their obedience, they win favor with Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to honor their God. And in chapter 1, we talked about some in chapter 2, the dreams that Daniel interpreted. By the first verse of chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar's forgotten all of that, and and he begins to you know talk about build an idol. Uh, but so what we're going to do is uh, dive into that and spend some time in uh, chapter three, and then just a few verses into chapter four. This will be our second installment uh, in uh, the book of Daniel, what we're calling Life in Babylon. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. So let's dive in. And um, this week, there's going to be quite a bit of scripture because chapter three is a long chapter. And what I want to do is usually I would maybe retell the story, but the Bible tells it rather well. And so instead of me kind of shortening it up and, and doing it that way, what I want to do is just kind of read through the passages of scripture. And so there'll be a lot of slides and a lot of scripture. And I tried to put more verses on each one instead of having, you know, 30 slides or something like that. So um, what we did last time is I kind of broke away and we put the slide up um, so that people who are, are watching this on their phone or something can read along. And I'm going to do that again this time and just see uh, for a little bit how it works rather than putting it up in a corner, say, picture in picture style. I'm just letting you know what to expect. I'm not trying to change things for the change, just for the sake of change, but to see if maybe we can... I serve better those who are using uh, smaller devices to be able to read along with us. But uh, So what I'll do is I'll read a few verses, and then we'll talk about what we read, and then we'll read a few, and we'll work our way uh, through, the, through the passage that way. So let's dive into J Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth was 6 cubits, about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. He set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, the king Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the, the magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, what we have here is an interesting phenomenon, and it's, and it's not uncommon in the region of Mesopotamia during that day for a king, specifically a big king, to want to set up an idol to a god more than likely. There's very little evidence that they set it up in their own image. I don't think there's, there's any indication that we have uh, an idol during that time in Mesopotamia to an image. What we do see is um, that Nebuchadnezzar likely would have set it up to one of his gods. And I say one of his gods because he was a polytheist, meaning he, he worshipped many gods. And for him, uh, his god was to be the top god. And by worshipping his god, bowing down to his god, the idol that he had made to, uh, what we see is then that he's asking people to give loyalty to him, bowing down, worshipping his god as the highest god is to worship Nebuchadnezzar as the highest king. And, and so he gathers all of the people from all the provinces. Now, remember, what he would do is train the people for a while that he brought in from other countries and then send them out. So he's gathering all these people, and it'd be a diverse group of people. There'd be uh, Jewish people and their Israelites. There'd be people from other provinces that he uh, had raided, that he had invaded. And the idea now at this time is, okay, well, let's bring all these people together. and let's, let's have a sign of loyalty to me as the top and to my God as the top God. There's a rub there. Okay, in that the Israelites had been told, you have no other God before me. And so what he does is he sets up an idol, and 90 feet tall is massive, and you'd be able to see it from a long ways around, is, uh, you know, to bring people in, they would bow down, touch their foreheads to the dirt. And that was a sign that they were, they were bowing down to, to Nebuchadnezzar and his God. And so let's continue to see uh, what happened in that regard. So he's called all these people together. Now, from this area, there's so many people spread out. Um, that it, you know, you wouldn't have been able to see everybody. And so uh, in verse four, it says, the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard that the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, so at this point, you know, we, we have this indication he, he wants everybody to do this one thing. It's part of assimilation. It's part of them leaving behind their distinctions, becoming one massive group. Why, why would he already have the furnace burning? You have to ask yourself that question. He, he already had the furnace burning because he knew some people would not like to do what he was asking them to do. If you say, I want you to do this and everybody wants to do it, there's no fiery furnace. But if you're pushing against resistance, right? If, if the people that you're telling to do what you're telling to do don't want to do it, then you set up the fiery furnace so that they know what their instant punishment is. And so Nebuchadnezzar had the furnace waiting. He had the fire built. The fire is burning. And so from, from what we see, everybody who was at the front followed. And uh, let's pick back up in the next verse. So we see in, in verse 8, therefore at the time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Now all the Jews, interestingly enough, not just two or three of them. And, and what we get here is a hint that the Jews were probably seen in worse favor than some of the others as a whole, as people who were, were assembled, not necessarily Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they had um, God's favor, but the Jews as a whole did not. So they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Okay, so they're just repeating to him what they know. And in verse 12, they say, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your God to worship the golden image that you have set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Okay, so what we have here is a, a loyalty situation. Nebuchadnezzar says, You're going to do this out of loyalty to me. I'm the king. 
you to show allegiance to me. I conquered your people. I brought you in. I assimilated you. I trained you. And now here you're going to bow down to the God of all gods, my God, and to me, the king of all kings, your king. And he asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay, I heard you didn't do it. What you going to do now? And so they're in this pressure field situation. Interestingly enough, Faith is usually developed in pressure-filled situations. Faith is usually refined by fire, okay? And literally, in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their faith is refined by fire. So what are they going to do? What, where do they go from here? What's the situation and how are they going to behave? And what we see pretty instantly is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not going to follow along with the situation regardless of the consequences. And that's the situation. We'll read in a minute their statement. But regardless of the consequences, they're not going to do it because they were told not to do it. They're not going to simulate. There are some things that they can and there's some things that they will not. And and this is a big one. Now, yeah, the Bible says, I shall have no other gods before me. It also says no idol or graven image. So uh, twice uh, they have issues with that. So let's read the next passage of scripture. And we pick up in verse 15. And 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 uh, Nebuchadnezzar is really, you'd say, magnanimous. He's being kind. He's giving them an opportunity to to correct their error. Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. That's generous. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God? who will deliver you out of my hands. Who is the God? Nebuchadnezzar made it about more than he and the three young men. He made it about God. Okay, so God's honor and glory are at stake. Let's see what God does. But first we have to figure out what Nebuchadnezzar, what Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to do. And in verse 16, they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar, filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their clothes, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. So we had this interesting situation. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, "Uh, what's your answer? And they said, we don't even need to answer you. And what I gather from that is that he knows that they're not supposed to do it, and they know they're not supposed to do it. So what is there left to say? What is there left to say? If he knows they're not supposed to do it, and that's why the threat of the burning fiery furnace, and they know they're not supposed to do it, then they just say, Lord, even if that's the case, God can save us. And that's a statement of faith. God can save us is a statement of faith. But then they go even further, and this is the interesting part. Uh, but if not, be it known, right? Let everybody know we're going to do what we're supposed to do. God can save us. If he doesn't, for whatever the reason, God is sovereign. He gives and takes away. If this is a takeaway instead of a give, we're going to follow through with our faith. And so it's a fascinating scenario here. And so he ordered the furnace heated seven times. Now, we're not talking, I think, about, okay, it's a 200-degree fire, and we're going to, you know, seven times at 1,400 degrees. They probably would have used a kiln-like fire in the first place, and it probably would have been exceptionally hot in the first place. What it might be is either hyperbole, uh, or since the people actually do something, he might be saying something like, throw seven times the amount of fuel on the fire. It would have gotten much bigger. It would have been uh, as hot as it ever could be. Uh, and, and so then he has them, uh, bound with the seven, with the, with the large men and the mighty men to bind them in a way that they couldn't escape. And he th- throws them into the fiery furnace. And I want to give you a couple images of the fiery furnace because when, when I'm thinking about a furnace, you know, I don't understand something on that scale. And so pictures help me. And I, th- I figure if pictures help me and maybe pictures will help you. What I envisage, envisage is a kiln-like situation. I'll show you the first picture. 
And what happens is in that picture, there's, there's uh, a door at the front. You can see that they can peek into because we say that Nebuchadnezzar is able to see in. If it was at, for one time, I thought just you'd have dump them in because it says they throw them into. Uh, and so I thought maybe, um, you know, look down into, but if the, the flames are coming up and the heat's coming up, that's probably not the situation. There's probably a door in the front like the picture you're seeing now. But I want to show you the next picture is an actual picture of something uh, built in that area. And it doesn't look like the first one. It's not round like we would think of with brick in that same way. But more than likely, you can see a rooftop on this one accessible from the back. The, the mighty men, the, the, the strong men of the army would have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego approach the top, which is the vent where the smoke comes up, and they'd drop them in that way. But you would still have a door from which the people who are watching could see into the fire. And so this is likely a very realistic. I don't know if this picture, I'm not, I'm not at all claiming that this is the picture it was found somewhere else. But something like this is possible with access from the top to drop them in, a window, a door from the front to watch them, you know. And so let's pick up reading because uh, we get an, uh, an idea of what um, the situation looks like. In verse 22, because the king order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the, the men took him up there, dropped him in, and the flame was so intense that they died. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery furnace. They fell bound into the fiery furnace. So King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose in haste. He declared to his counselors, did, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true king, true, O king. Then he answered and said, but I see four men unbound, waiting, walking in the midst of the fire and they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So, so what we're saying here is that from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, again, polytheistic, this looks like, as somebody who is a God, he believes in a lot of gods. Maybe this is the son of the one of the gods. And he says, I see four of them in there. Okay. And so what we have is a situation where uh, from that from Nebuchadnezzar's, it's the son of God. From ours, who is it? Could it be an angel? Could it be a manifestation of Jesus, the son of the actual living God? In the Old Testament, we see some of those when, when Abraham and Sarah entertained angels unaware. Uh, it, you know, the Bible talks about them being, being uh, likened to the Son of God in that way. Uh, and we see other manifestations of God in particular instances uh, do something supernatural and divine. Well, that's taken Nebuchadnezzar by, by uh, surprise. Not only that, but it seems like the fire burned the ropes. <laughs> but not clothes and not people. And then there's, for somebody, for Nebuchadnezzar, there's somebody in the fire with him. Uh, it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar sees him. It doesn't really tell us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego see him at this point. And so let's keep reading. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. He has this recognition that maybe his God is not the Most High. His God is high, but not the Most High. Come out. And come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they came out of the fire. They walked out through that, that door that we see. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and they saw several things. Uh, fire had not not had any power. Now, that's an interesting thing. So it didn't say fire didn't burn. It said fire, the power was taken away from the fire. Well, well, who could take away power from fire if not the God who made fire, if not the creator of heaven and earth? So it said that it didn't have any power of their bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. So, so the, <laughs> the Bible's trying to exaggerate on purpose just how little effect this fire had if they came out not even smelling like smoke. Anybody who lights a grill or anybody who lights a, a backyard fire knows it doesn't take long to smell like it, smell like smoke. So Nebuchadnezzar said in, in verse 28, he answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So look at this. He's not saying blessed be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he says who has sent his angel and delivered his servants. So who's the fourth man in the fire? Well, the Bible tells us, you know, a little bit. Nebuchadnezzar thought it was a son, like the son of the gods or an angel who trusted in him and set aside the king's command 
and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Okay? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out looking uh, nice and shiny because they made the right decision in that situation. But they didn't receive the honor and glory for their simple obedience. The whole idea of the whole story was that God would receive honor and glory. And what we see in the way that Nebuchadnezzar responded is that he had the right response in that he knew these three men weren't responsible. They, they showed obedience. But the fourth man in the fire indicated a supernatural intervention in that. And so what we see is God getting the glory for it. So what I'm saying is sometimes we're tested in this life. And when we're tested in this life and we pass, it's not so that we can say, look, I survived. I'm a survivor. I was a victim, but now I'm a survivor. No, it's to say, look, God gives and he takes away. And God, uh, you know, I showed simple obedience to the command of God. And what happened as a result of that is, look, God received honor and glory, not me. And that's kind of a difficult thing for a lot of us to understand. When we talk about Nebuchadnezzar, it's all ego. I want to build a statue to my God. I want to be worshipped. I want to be lifted up. I want loyalty to myself. When we switch around to God, in the God servants, we're not saying we want all the honor and attention. And, and No, we're saying we want that for God. So um, Nebuchadnezzar is the, the um, key uh, representation of ego. Uh, servants of the Most High God are the key representations of servants. And that's what Jesus said. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we keep reading, and, and so Nebuchadnezzar has a turnaround. He says, uh, therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon, uh, it speaks against anything that God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, that's the end of the first of the third chapter. But the, the, it, there's a little bit of carryover into the fourth chapter. And because something keeps going, but again, it's, it's mentioning the God. There's no other God who's able to rescue these men. In other words, out of all the gods that Nebuchadnezzar saw and followed, out of all of the assimilated gods of the group, no other God could do that. So he says, let's not make that God unhappy at us. That's basically what he's saying. So anybody guilty of doing that is going to be... Uh, ripped from shreds. So let's read the first three verses of the next chapter and give us an indication of where the story kind of wraps up. King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this is the the decree, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all of the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures for generation to generation. It is an interesting thing that King Nebuchadnezzar then is able to realize that he has a place in God's plan. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a place in God's plan. We all have a place in God's plan. At the beginning of chapter 1, it tells us that the king of Israel was turned into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar sees that a little bit more clearly, he understands that a little bit more clearly. And what he's able to do then is say, okay, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this for a while, but God is blessing me in that. And that's an incredibly interesting that Nebuchadnezzar could go so quickly from disdain for the God of um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though he held them in high honor, uh, to now uh, you know, wanting to, to throw them into the fiery furnace that was heated seven times hot, hotter, and then now he's turning around and he's praising God again. So, so simple obedience of the people in situations where we're in a pressure situation, our faith is refined by fire. The result of that is that God is honored and glorified in a mighty way through our lives. And so the testing of, of, of our faith, when we're in a position where the culture around us thinks something differently than we do, to not yield, to not break, to not, okay, well, you have this God, so let's, let's worship that God. God said, don't have any other gods. Well, God said a whole lot of other things. And we need to follow those. We need to follow his commandments. We need to follow his law and his rules. And, and when we do that in a situation where nobody else is doing it, we stand out. And, and the best way for us to stand out is not as ourselves, but as representations of the love of God. And, and so um, this is a wonderful, powerful um, passage about that. Now, I would suggest that maybe the turning point in that is 
uh, our God can save us from this fire, but if not, we're still going to do it. We're still going to do what we know is right. I hope that you're doing well, and I hope that these uh, studies and uh, life in Babylon are helping you in some way or practical in helping you uh, figure out how to live in, in what for us is sometimes becoming a culture in which a God is not honored, and yet we, we stand in the midst to honor God. So I hope you have a great week. We look forward to seeing you again the next, next week. 